What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke, aka Dancewaite here, and welcome back to this playthrough of Five Fantasy X in which I try to complete the entire game and all of the side quests that I can by only using the auto battle function or attack only. We've had a hell of a run so far, and in the last session I started to get going with some of the post-game. We went into the Omega Ruins, we started encountering the enemies there, which were relatively easy, all the way until we reached Omega himself, who turned out to be a little bit too much for our current party. And so I took some time to do some capturing in Omega, and then once I was back in the Monster Arena, I decided to take on some of the Area Conquest monsters to see if I could defeat those guys. And the going was pretty good so far. We managed to defeat almost all of them. I think there were three that I couldn't defeat. And so I was gonna move on to species creations to see if we could take out any of those guys who are a tier above the area conquest. And then once I've beaten everything that I can with my current setup, it was time to kind of look back and see what we could do and whether we had any new things that we could farm as a result of enemies that we could defeat. As always, thank you all for the massive support on this series. I would appreciate it very much if you could continue to show that love and drop a like for the video. So let's get going with the next episode of the Five Fantasy X Auto Battle Challenge. So yes, we find ourselves deep in the monster arena, trying to defeat as many of the bosses there as possible. And we've had a pretty good run of it so far, but I was definitely curious to see how we did against those species creations. So these guys are definitely, on average, I would say, a notable step up. Like the average HP is higher, the average stats are higher, and so the odds of me defeating the same number of species creations as Area Conquest is pretty low. So let's just see how it goes, and we'll start things off with the first one, Fenrir. So starting with an ambush is not good, but you saw Evade Encounter doing his job there. So Fangs of Hell is a good one because it can't hit us, but you're already spotting a massive problem here. Fangs of Chaos and Fangs of Ruin both hit, and we don't have Confusion Protection, which is, of course, something that's been plaguing us for a lot of the run so far. And also, it's the first time in the Monster Arena that we've really struggled to hit something. This guy's evasion is very good, and so pair that very high evasion with good agility, and two attacks that we can't avoid, and you can see that it's pretty difficult to defeat this guy already, even though he doesn't have any attacks that hit the entire party, which was generally the biggest problem that we had with some of the area conquest that we couldn't defeat. But one thing that Fenrir can't do is heal itself, and you're seeing, especially thanks to Fangs of Hell, we're able to land those counter attacks. So it's not going well, we're getting KO'd a lot here, but we are chipping away, we are doing damage here. And so already I was thinking, well, maybe if I just stick around here and uh, we just tough it out with Auto Phoenix, maybe we can still just do enough to, to take this guy out. But with that 800,000 HP, we might not actually have enough. So this could be pretty close. I could actually run out of Phoenix Downs here and really not have enough to defeat this guy. So let's see how this goes. I mean, the Auto Phoenix trick is brilliant as you guys have been seeing it can really help you topple enemies that are way way stronger than you are but it only works for as long as you actually have phoenix downs available and so back in the the old like no sphere grid days when you're trying to take on these like epic bosses um and you're trying to rely on that auto phoenix the hard limit is always when you run out of phoenix downs it's game over and it's pretty much the same thing with these guys and as you can see um we are missing so frequently that the damage we're doing is very slow. So at this point, I was pretty unconvinced that we'd be able to win this fight um, with enough Phoenix Downs in our inventory. So let me skip ahead and show you guys what happened. So I literally went on to times four speed because this was taking ages. And I had at this point, I had no idea. The fight had gone on for a very long time. And I was just sitting back and watching and waiting to see what would happen here. Uh, good old auto battle. I mean, this is what it's for. Imagine having to do to do all of this manually. <laughs> it's nice to be able to just speed this up and just sit back and watch and see what would happen. But again, the celestial weapons having the the inability to do high damage when you're on low HP was starting to hurt us here as well because we were getting KO'd a lot, as you can see. And so even when we were making some hits, um, we weren't doing as much damage as we could be. So unfortunately, on our first encounter, Fenrir proved too much for us as we ran out of Phoenix Downs and we ended up losing the battle. So yeah, add Fenrir to the list of enemies we couldn't defeat. And if we failed even at Fenrir, then it, there was a chance that a lot of these guys would end in failure. So I skipped straight on. I wasn't going to dwell on that. Let's head straight to Ornithalestes, which is uh, one of the more difficult names to pronounce <laughs> in the monster arena. 
But this was looking a bit more promising because I was landing hits, but I kind of went a bit too hard here. Um, you've got to restock the Phoenix Downs, man. If you're trying to use Auto Phoenix, you kind of need Phoenix Downs for that. So yeah, I, I decided to, to kind of pump the brakes, <laughs> go buy some items, because I spent so much time just waiting for Fenrir. I wanted to get on with it and keep making progress, but you've got to obviously remember to, to stock up before you continue. And so yeah, it's time to give it another go. But things were already looking optimistic because I had managed to land hits a bit more easily than I did against Fenrir. And that's pretty much what I needed because the reason we couldn't defeat Fenrir was because my accuracy slash luck stat wasn't high enough to hit that guy consistently. And so it took way too long to do the damage necessary to win. So let's go for it again and see what would happen. Now, as you saw, 25,000 per hit, that's really good. I mean, the defense is pretty low for, for Ornithalestes, but we are missing a decent number still, as you can see. So maybe I got a little bit lucky um, during my first attempts. Now, his evasion is lower than, um, than Fenrir's, and that will make a difference. But again, due to the poison that we're receiving here, we are going to spend much of the battle in low HP, and that really hurts our damage output. So you're really starting to see the manifestation of the celestial weapon problem here. It's really, it's just getting progressively worse at the moment. And again, I wanted to just stick it out with this party who were, who were ready for as long as I could, but you can see it wasn't, like in hindsight, I probably should have just automatically gone with Auron here um, instead of one of these three. It would have been the better idea. Now, also another big problem with Ornith is that it uses drain touch. And so when you're already doing relatively limited damage, and is doing Drain Touch and healing for a pretty nice chunk, more than we are damaging it most of the time, then it's looking pretty clear that even this guy, even though it looked promising for the first few turns, is another one that we can't defeat because, well, we kind of need some sort of poison protection or auto med or something like that so that we don't spend as much time in low HP. And well, we need to hit it consistently and do a lot of damage because the Drain Touch is a bit too strong. Now. As it goes down in HP, it's going to start to use Drain Touch more and more, and that's going to make things even worse. And so, in general, this was a bad matchup for us and this auto battle team as it currently stands. Now, one really fun trick that you can do against this guy that I'm sure a lot of people watching would have seen before or done themselves is if you zombify one of your own characters, then when it uses Drain Touch, it ends up damaging itself. So it's a really fun way to basically get it to commit suicide by constantly Drain Touching you and killing itself. But obviously with these particular restrictions, we have no way of zombifying ourselves. So we can't utilize something like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't work if you try to zombify Ornith itself. You have to zombify yourself and it has to try to use Train Touch on you for it to work. So that's the idea. But unfortunately, as you can see, this was an exercise in futility once again. And so we had a pretty bad start to uh, the species conquest, unfortunately. And so eventually I was like, you know what, this is just a waste of time. So I end up uh, quitting this battle because you're just not going to be able to hang in there long enough and do enough damage to defeat this guy. So Ornith reigns supreme first time round. At this point, I decided to take a little break. I did know that I could defeat this one, um, but I wanted to do a couple of things first before I came back to it. So I wanted a little bit more in the way of um, like sphere levels for Kimari. He was close to 99. I wanted to get him a little bit higher. Two, um, there were a few more kind of four slotted weapons. I could get some death proof and that kind of stuff. And I could also farm teleport spheres as well to an extent. And the way I wanted to do this was just by fighting the uh, Master Tomberry in the Omega Ruins over and over again. So I did spend like 10 or 15 minutes having some battles against, um, against the Master Tomberry and just trying to get a couple of extra things in order to be a bit more prepared against Ornithalesta. So I'll show you guys some quick highlights uh, of those battles and then how I prepared for my rematch against Ornith. I mean, the battle itself, of course, is a complete formality at this point, so there's not much to think about on that front. But it does drop you some really nice armors. It does give Kimari some nice AP as well, especially if he has a double AP weapon. And um, you can also potentially get stuff like Deathproof. And as a rare drop, you can get two Teleport Spheres as well. So that's why it was uh, something I wanted to do, just to give me a little bit more maneuverability um, around the sphere grid, and also, obviously, to be able to customize more evade encounter if I needed it for a specific battle. So just a, a little kind of mini detour here where I fought some Master Tomberries. And so after I say about six or seven battles, I was already kind of, I, I felt like I got what I needed and I was ready to move on for another attempt against Ornith where I had to prepare a little bit better this time around. So you see the two teleport spheres there and yet another soul arm guard. So it's a nice little drop there. 
because there are going to be enemies that use death uh, and it might be a very good idea to have some death proof. So, let's make some preparations this time. See what we can do. So yeah, now I can add an evading counter here. So piercing, magic counter, evading counter as well. It's a nice little weapon. If you don't need to break the damage limit, it's sometimes better to get a consistent quad nine than it is to uh, deal with like the celestial weapon issue. And so that was generally my logic there. So I deliberately switched to a weapon that can't break the damage limit at the moment. So Kimari doesn't have a poison proof here, but I decided to just leave it for now. And I wanted to see if that was going to be enough to do it this time around. So let's see how things change. Now, <laughs> this is also still not looking that great, but at least even when we're on this low HP here, we're still able to hit for the maximum damage when we do connect. But you also got to see how often drain touch starts happening. That's when the battle can kind of swing because it can gain back a decent chunk of HP. But I was hoping that by being able to hit quad nine, when I did hit, I'd be able to still overpower that drain touch. So that was the plan. So you can see my survivability is much higher than the previous attempt. And I'm no longer doing, you know, silly, like, you know, I think I was doing like 3000 damage at some point when I was on low HP. So now we have at least consistent damage. So I'm going to fast forward again uh, and show you guys how this one played out with this uh, particular setup. So again, I spent a fair bit of time here, but it was looking increasingly like even with quad nine damage, like a consistent quad nine, I was still missing too much and that drain touch was still hurting too much. So I took the L on Ornith as well. So we were zero for two um, in, the, in the Species Conquest. So I had to set up once again, and this time I was gonna find something that I was pretty sure I could defeat. And that was Terex. So this guy has 100,000 HP. So you can see my characters coming in, we land the hits, it's got auto regen, but it's fine. But then this happens. So I'm gonna pause for a sec here to explain why that happened. Basically, Beak of Woe is a really interesting move. It is literally three moves in one. So it's not the case that it gets three moves in a row. It's just that the move itself has three different attacks. So think of it as like a whole party attack that just happens individually. And so that's why Auto Phoenix can't kick in in between the individuals. But just bear in mind that this specific like three pronged Beak of Woe is only the first one that it does. So it's programmed to have a special first Beak of Woe but then the rest of them, they will be singular. But this first one always plays out in this particular way. So this is really interesting. This guy is usually one of the biggest like pushover bosses. Uh, even in No Sphere Grid, you literally come into the battle, mix a trio of quad nine, um, Waka uses attack reels and it's game over. Like that's how easy this guy is. But under specific circumstances, if you're not prepared, it can do this to you. So this is the interesting part about um, Terex. And so yeah, this was just not a good start. Against the, the species, I was doing absolutely terribly. But I knew I could defeat this guy, I just had to be a bit more prepared. But you can really see, I'm starting to get to the end of what I can do with the stats that I have. I'm really starting to get bullied now by a lot more of the bosses. So yeah, you can see I'm starting to say, you know what, okay, I think it's time to, to take myself to the next level a little bit here because if even Terex is coming in and Beak of Woe is just completely destroying you, then you're probably not uh, doing too great. So I thought, let me just uh, power up a little more here. So I used about 60 sphere levels here. This was a, a relatively significant chunk of stats that I improved uh, with this little run that I went on. But it really felt like it was time to do this. I mean, I'd been sitting on these sphere levels for a long time at this stage. And so at this stage, I was starting to push closer to that magic quad 9 HP. Strength up to 120, defense up to 63, and agility at 74 for Waka, which was pretty decent and a nice step up from what we had previously. So now that we're done, let's have a very quick overview of the stats that the boys are rocking before they go in for some more attempts against the species. Basically, um, they are at around 120 strength, 60 defense, and about 75 to 100 agility between them. You can see the big weakness is still magic defense. It's really not looking too great. But of course, through the work that we've done, our accuracy has improved a little bit as well. So hopefully our chances of hitting some of the more difficult enemies is also a bit better. So now that we have this sort of preparation in place, let's see if this uh, increase in stats, like 60 sphere levels worth, is that going to be enough to change the outcome? So I went back in for another go against Terex and I wanted to see if I could survive. Now this time, as you can see, with the increase in stats, we were able to survive um, the Beak of Woe. And so that's the difference it can make. The boost in defense and the boost in HP meant I was able to stay alive. So now it's the same problem once again. Can we hit this thing enough to kill it? 
and well, auto regen is also happening. So you're seeing a lot of enemies that are proving tough to hit and they have ways to heal themselves. So two out of the first three battles in Species Conquest have a way to heal. And you can see it wasn't great. I was kind of hoping to breeze past this guy after this little boost in stats. And especially after I survived Beak of Woe, I thought, yeah, this should be easy now. As you can see, it's not doing too great so far. But when we do hit, we're doing like a nice 18, 20,000 sort of damage. And the auto regen is not working that great because it has such low HP. And so I was still hoping that if we just stuck it out this time, we'd get our first win against the Species Conquest. Because we are hitting it at a decent enough rate. Even if it's like 20%, 30%, it's not too bad. And there you go. So we finally defeated our first Species Conquest. It still proved harder than I would have hoped, but we got it done. And so there we go, things were looking up. I finally managed to defeat the first one. And with that, I was thinking, okay, I have a chance of maybe beating a few more of these at least before I call it a day and try to go back for some more kind of stat increases and equipment and preparation. So of course I decided to try and take on Ornith one more time to see if with these boosted stats, I could do a little bit better. So I stuck with my Celestial Weapons, hoping that I would do nice, like big chunks of damage this time. Uh, that could offset the healing even when I had lower HP. So let's try again. You can see a significant increase in damage here. So Terex has uh, an armored status, which you guys didn't see. And so if you're wondering how the hell did the damage jump up to like 30,000 all of a sudden, that's because this guy isn't armored. And so that makes a relatively big difference. So you can see the damage really kicking in here. So now it was looking much more likely that we'd actually be able to, to get a win here. It's like 30,000, 55,000. These are just like massive chunks of damage. And so even if it's healing for like 10 to 15,000 every time it uses Drain Touch, uh, provided we got enough hits once again, I mean, we did have more accuracy. So I was hoping to hit it at least like 10, 10, 15% more than I could previously. And I was hoping that that combination would be enough to take this guy down. And so it was looking promising. I mean, seeing those big chunks of damage come in, I was thinking surely now we've got to be able to do this. And so this time around, things worked out a bit differently. Third time lucky, I managed to defeat Ornith thanks to my much better strength and my ability to actually hit it a little bit more frequently than I did previously. So we're still missing a lot, but we're making enough hits and we are doing big damage now when we hit. And so the extra, I think it was around 20 strength that we had more than we did previously. And so that was a nice feather in my cap. And there you go, that armor kicking in also as well. The poison proof armor did help. Now, the next enemy that we had also was another one that had a lot of annoying status effects, and so I wanted to see if I could potentially stand up to it. This one has less HP. I think it's like 630,000, but still obviously a pretty huge amount. And again, it's a small flying enemy, but weirdly enough, its evasion is not that great, uh, considering that it's a small flyer type. Its evasion is good, but it's, it's nothing too special. And you can see the boys are pretty much hitting most of the time and so this was good to see and i figured if i'm doing this much damage and i'm hitting consistently that pitiful kuraga is not going to be enough to save it so this one basically it can't heal itself that kuraga is i don't know why they gave it a move like that it's really pointless but there you go it's not going to get too much chance to really do anything here because we're just uh, we're too strong at the moment so you can see like 50 60 sphere levels and everything starts to look a little bit different here and so now our fortunes had changed. We'd gone from zero out of three to three out of four. Let's continue straight on with yet another flyer. This one again, not too difficult to hit and has a very limited amount of HP as you just saw. So Titus landed a critical and Vidatu didn't even get a move in. So this was, now we were kind of back to uh, where I think we should be. One eye. An important enemy to defeat in many a run. And let's see if we could do it. Another critical from Titus. And yeah, didn't even get a move. Because the first move, I think it's called Shockwave. It can do a lot of damage and it can give you some nasty status effects. And so that was very important. Another reason one eye was important is because you saw the triple score weapon for Waka. And so if you do want to do a bit more stat maxi stuff, it's going to be hard to kind of get the exact weapons that you need to do it, but you can get magic defense spheres, which are very helpful, and you can get some nice triple AP weapons. So one eye, the fact that I could defeat it so easily was an important part of the rest of the game because it is helpful in making it easier for you to stat max. So you saw the shockwave come in this time, 
and you can see the difference it made there. So if a shock wave comes in like that, before you can hit it twice or three times, then you're gonna have a problem. But you saw the first two battles completely breezed it. And so yeah, I thought while I'm here, let's reel off a few more wins against One Eye. Try to get some more magic defense spheres because these boys were seriously lacking in magic defense as you saw. And also maybe pick up some triple AP for the party members. So I did hang around for a little while. And so once again, I decided to start really taking the limiters off here and get people moving. Because, I mean, I wasn't too far away from the original creations and from the Dark Aeons and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, we need to just, uh, we need to really start moving here and getting to the higher tiers of stats. Especially with the magic defense. As you guys saw against Omega Weapon as well, that Ultima is extremely powerful. And so despite being as strong as we are now, our physical defense is okay for like non-Dark Aeon and non-original creation type enemies. But the magic defense is completely pitiful. So we are going to have to start moving um, the magic defense up as well. So I decided to group the team together. This is something I do quite frequently when I'm maxing stats. I try to get everybody on the same kind of sphere node and basically move them all along together. And one of the ways in which that helps is that, of course, if you start laying down extra purple spheres to gain stats, they can all kind of benefit from it together. But apparently this time around, I thought I was going to do that. But Waka was missing um, part of Auron's grid, and so I wanted a piece of that. So I decided to take him around um, some of Auron's grid first, and eventually he's going to end up around where Kimari and Titus is anyway. So I didn't use the Friend Sphere, but the general idea was to pick up uh, a couple more of these areas of the Sphere grid, and then move him along with the rest of them. So the limiters, again, they really started to come off here, because we were starting to head towards some of the hardest battles the game has to offer. And so once Waka joined the rest of his teammates, we could start to lay down these magic defense spheres and start to boost that up. Because once we got that boosted too, then the team was going to start to become much more capable of taking on even the most powerful enemies that the game has to offer. So anytime I found an empty node, just go for that magic defense. I wasn't in like the hyper optimizing, let's like delete nodes and you know swap plus twos or plus fours and all that kind of stuff. I thought for now, let's just lay down a plus four wherever we find it, and then we'll just go from there. And so once all that was done, I decided to just continue along the sphere grid as well, and start using up more of these magic defense spheres that I had. And already, by the end of that process, you can see HP quad nine, strength 130, but magic defense, importantly, all the way up to 63 at this point. So we were at a whole different level of magic defense as well. So I left Wonka and Kimari a little bit further behind. Um, they didn't have, have the sphere levels that Titus did, but I want to show also the difference between having like 65 magic defense and having more like 28 to 30 magic defense. So let's take something on and see what happens. Now, what I was gonna take on was a battle that I knew was impossible to win in this challenge. Um, you're gonna see why very soon, but even Titus, with his like 65 supposedly good magic defense, uh, took a quad nine from just a water spell. So this was not a good sign. <laughs> so yeah, these guys are no match for Jumbo Flan, and the primary reason this guy is impossible is something you've already noticed on screen. It's immune to all physical damage. And so this means that there is absolutely nothing, nothing you can do here. There are no statuses that you can afflict it with. There's nothing you can do. This battle is flat out impossible in every single way. And so there you go. This is the first time we've encountered something in this run that is completely impossible. Not due to, I guess, like a mechanical reason, like you can't target a specific part of it, but simply because you flat out cannot, you're not allowed to damage it. And the game forces you to use something other than physical attacks in order to kill it. So Jumbo Flan is something we will never be able to defeat in this challenge and the first one of its kind, I would say, in that respect. And so I move swiftly on to Nega Elemental. Now this one has a ton of HP once again. It's like 1.2, 1.3. It's like one of those, it's that kind of range. It has extremely powerful magic attacks, but because we have the Celestial Weapons, we can ignore the very high physical defense it has and do some significant damage. But the whole thing against this guy is, can you survive the powerful magic? So let's have a look. Titus has over 60 magic defense. Waka and Kimari have around 30. And you can see Titus took around 11,000 and Waka and Kimari took around 15. So they're not quite ready yet, but Titus isn't too far away. And so with this, it was clear we hit like another brick wall in terms of stats, at least for our magic defense. 
And so I thought, you know what? It's been a while since I took on Fenrir in terms of my stats. So let's give Fenrir another go. We are faster, we are stronger, and we are more accurate than we were before. So I figured this time, surely, I should be able to get it done against Fenrir. Mostly because we are able to do giant damage now. So one of the reasons people don't really notice the Celestial Weapons having the issue with like low HP, low damage, is because once your strength is high enough, even when you're at like a quarter of your HP, you're still doing huge, huge amounts of damage, and so you won't notice it. But when you're at, say, like strength 80, strength 100, and you're taking on more difficult stuff, you're gonna do like 20, 30K damage and think that's great. And then when you notice it drop down to like two or 3K, you're gonna start to say, well, hold on a minute, like this is terrible. I, I could do better if I had um, a non-celestial weapon. So now though, you're starting to see Titus with 130 uh, strength here, even when he's at half HP, hopefully he does connect soon. Of course, he's missing all the time again now. There you go, 35,000, even when he's at half HP. So when you start seeing those kind of numbers, you're like, okay, it doesn't really matter that he's not doing like his absolute maximum damage because 35K is still a great number. And so it matters less. So imagine when you're at like 255 strength, then you're really just not gonna notice as much um, the fact that they're doing less damage when they have less HP. So that's kind of also what I was hoping for. That's that's why I decided to try to stick with this team for as long as I could. And if there ever became a, like if we ever faced something where even that was not enough, so we had 255 strength and still, um, when we're at low HP, the low damage was causing us to lose, then of course it will be time to bring someone like Auron into the mix and, uh, and make a change. Walker stayed confused for absolute ages here. It's like one of the longest confusion runs of the entire game, pretty much. He just he just spent most of the battle just confused. He wouldn't get taken out, he just evaded everything. Fenrir refused to attack it. Waka was still confused by the end of the battle, but we did get the win this time. So this means that up until um, Jumbo Flan, we defeated everything. And now Fenrir is also another important battle because Fenrir is a source of agility spheres. So if you want to get to that magic 170 agility, one of the, the good ways to do it quickly is to defeat Fenrir. So that was another reason why it was a good idea. But it was time to move swiftly on to Tanket, and I was curious to see again what we'd do here. The Celestial Weapons were doing a pretty good job once again. Um, not too bad at all, I would say. This guy does have that tough armor status, of course, so it's not doing as much damage as you saw against the likes of Fenrir. But I thought, you know what, this guy can't really heal itself. So, yes, when it uses Rush Attack, it's very, very fast. But overall, I thought to myself, you know what, the three guys should still be powerful enough to take this guy out, even with the speed of Rush Attack. The way Auto Phoenix works, again, you get brought back pretty much uh, instantly anyway. And so unless it, it basically found a way to Rush Attack everybody equally every single time, then we'd have problems. But as you're seeing here, yes, it is a bit annoying to constantly have to revive from Rush Attack, but... It was only a matter of time until we won. I would say this would have played out similarly to Fenrir if uh, we were doing less damage. So if we had the stats we had at the start of this particular episode of the series, then we'd be doing a lot less damage. And so maybe it would be able to get 99 KOs in before we did all the damage necessary. But it's definitely not enough to hang with us. So it did its best with the, with the rush attack, but wasn't a problem. So Defense Sphere is also available to us now. And that's why I really wanted to make sure I gave the Species Conquest a go, because um, the purple spheres that they give you can be so useful for stat maxing. And so we're straight on to Fafnir, who was another important encounter. And this one I was much less sure if we'd be able to win. So let's check it out. We're doing decent damage, but not great. Once again, we have some Armored Status stuff going on here, so we're not quite as powerful. But you saw that nice elemental attack that it did against us and it killed us off. So a lot of HP and a powerful elemental attack that hits everybody. So Fafnir was looking like uh, a bit too much at the moment, but I decided to have a quick look at my equipment anyway to see if there was anything I could do. Now, elemental protection and keeping Auto Phoenix was obviously gonna be a bit impossible. So it felt a little bit unlikely at this stage that anything would really work, but I didn't wanna just give up on the first attempt. So I had a quick look at what I had in my inventory to see if I could possibly find some kind of combination that could offset the brutal elemental damage enough to win against this guy. 
basically auto protect was at stake. If I could do this, I could get auto protect. Without it, you're not really going to be able to uh, to get light curtain. So there you go. Unfortunately, still wasn't enough. It's still a very very powerful enemy, and well, it has a triple attack. So it hits one of your enemies, does the the widespread elemental attack, and then hits you again. So it was just a, a really brutal enemy to face at this stage. So it wasn't looking too great. But I really wanted to have like auto protect on tap. And so when you can defeat Fafnir, the ability to do that, I thought might make the difference. But honestly, at this stage, I had to give up against Fafnir. It was too hard. So I moved straight on to Steve Sprout. Another one that was <laughs> potentially a problem, as you can see here. So... Yeah, it all happened very fast. At this stage, I was trying to rattle through as many as I could, but I'll take a second to pause here to explain the battle. Uh, basically, that move that you saw there, Good Knight, obviously is very brutal, but the best thing about this guy is that it has very low HP compared to its counterparts. So much like how we can defeat Vidatu, if you can do max damage, then you can take this guy out in a single hit. And so that was the key there. So Titus did about 70,000 damage. If he could have hit like the max damage, then the battle ends in one turn. Now, obviously, there's two ways to, to deal with this issue. The first one is to just go and get some more strength, have enough strength to hit the absolute max damage, and then you can move on. Another strategy is to basically just keep retrying the battle until Titus gets a critical hit. And so that's what I decided to do. So you're going to see like a, another attempt or two here while I try to do that. But once Titus lands a critical, and he does have a bit more luck than the others, so he does have a decent chance of landing a critical, then the battle's over anyway. So that's what I decided to go for. And before long, Titus did get the critical, and so he managed to defeat Sleep Sprout without having to kind of level up any higher. Sleep Sprout is another nice enemy to defeat because it drops teleport spheres as standard, and it drops very nice status protection armor, something that could be useful to us in the future as well. So let's keep moving. Bomb King in my head should have been pretty much a formality. So let's see how it ended up going. And so you can see the damage here is just really, really obscene and Bomb King can't hang. So this battle was very, very easy. No problem here. And there's nothing really good to be obtained from Bomb King either. So we can just, uh, we can keep rolling. So from there, it was on to Juggernaut, another important enemy here. And honestly, I wasn't feeling too good about this one. It does have armor, so we're seeing some criticals here to begin with, but when you don't hit criticals, then you're not doing great in terms of damage. 1.3 million HP in that range. Again, always check these annotations in case I make a mistake, but you also saw that very powerful salvo attack that completely destroyed me. Now, this one, because it's not a triple attack like Fafnir, I thought maybe there's a chance that I can deal with this. If I can take that salvo and survive it, then we might be okay. So I decided to have a look through my stuff once again and see if having some fire protection would be enough to deal with this guy. Because if I can survive the salvo and be revived, the rest of it is all singular attacks. So I decided to just make that little adjustment. And I thought, you know what? We are still doing pretty good damage here. Maybe that's going to be enough to take out the juggernaut. So preemptive strike. And we're getting straight in. So I mean, look at that. Preemptive strike, six attacks. We did almost like 200,000 damage or something the first time around. And so no auto phoenix for Kimari and Waka. And without auto phoenix, you're seeing like that auto phoenix makes such a difference. Without it, we were looking pretty good there. We were like really piling on the damage. But without auto phoenix, we got completely crushed. So more tweaks needed, but you can see the fire protection um, if I could have the fire protection and auto phoenix, then it was going to be game over for this guy. But I needed to make sure I had that available. So let's take a look here. What if everybody had fire protection? Could we survive long enough that way? So another preemptive strike. I got lucky here. And I started with a critical. Let's see how we do here. So the salvo is going to do absolutely nothing to me. And so I thought maybe now we can do it because it is pretty slow. As you can see, I mean, it is very slow. But unfortunately, Crush Spike is one that we can't avoid. And it happened to use it three times in a row. And so still, it wasn't working. Like, this one felt within reach, but it was a bit frustrating. I felt like surely there's got to be some combination that I can have to, to be able to defeat this guy. And so it was time to have one more look to see if there were any tweaks I could make. Now, I knew the obvious tweak would be to basically give Titus Auto Phoenix, and I figured with that, 
there should be a very good chance I could defeat this guy. But I didn't know if I wanted to sacrifice the last batch of Phoenix Downs that I had. But eventually I thought, you know what, screw it. Let's sacrifice it and see if we can do it. If it turns out to not be worth it, then I can always reload the save anyway. And so I did give Titus the Auto Phoenix. So we had Fire Protection for everybody. And Titus also had Auto Phoenix. So I wanted to see if this would be enough. Now, this would fail if um, Juggernaut used Crush Spike on Titus very quickly. But if not, then we should be able to get the win. So let's see how this went. So I need a little bit of RNG in our favor here. It's what happens from here onwards that's going to dictate things. So this is all fine. But obviously, once again, once we're revived by Titus, uh, the damage output is going to be much lower. Now, once again, you saw that Kimari wasn't able to evade its attacks, which is a bit of a shame. And if you could, then obviously things would be way easier and this battle would be over in no time. But they've got to make this guy obviously sufficiently difficult. Not being able to evade Crush Spike, I think, is very fair. But, um, but the attack being non-evadable, I think, is a bit annoying. But yeah, Kimari healed back up to full HP, so he's doing more damage, so that was pretty clutch. And you can see it's going very well. I'm getting that RNG. So first time around, I got really nice RNG. Titus didn't get crush spiked. And I managed to defeat Juggernaut. And I got two Strength Spears as well. So that worked out absolutely perfectly. I don't think I can rely on that RNG very often. But it worked out exactly how I hoped. And Ironclad, of course, I was missing uh, 10 of the Iron Giants in the Thunder Plains. So I had to quickly go and capture some more Iron Giants. And then I could take on Ironclad, who was the most difficult species creation. And so I came back a few minutes later and I got my 60 mana tablets and I unlocked Ironclad. So this guy is a beast because he has 2 million HP, but also another hugely important encounter because he gives you two HP spheres. So if you ever want to have more HP than what the sphere grid gives you, this guy really is pretty much the only way to be able to farm those HP spheres and to boost your HP up towards that absolute maximum 99,999. So let's take a look because at the end of the day, if you want to take on Dark Aeons and you're not really able to heal that well, you're probably going to need some massive HP. So let's see what happens here. So I did come into the, the battle with the wrong weapons. I didn't select what I should have selected. But honestly, it's not going to matter too much. So let me show you this first attempt again so you can understand what's going on here. Um, Repageki is a counter-attack that it does, and so you can't evade and counter it because you can't evade and counter a counter-attack. So we've seen that in action before. So any enemy that has a counter that always hits, that's a massive problem. So you are going to have to deal with that, and then Bushinzan comes in and wipes everybody out. So for Ironclad, you really do need to be pretty Ironclad yourself to be able to survive it, and that was not something that we were ready for. So Ironclad was also undefeated as a result of this. So let's take a minute to kind of think about what happened here. With Species Conquest, it ended up being fairly similar. We did do some significant stat boosting, but we ended up defeating everything except for Jumbo Flan, who will always remain impossible. We cannot defeat Jumbo Flan. Uh, Negro Elemental had too much ultimate damage, so we needed some more magic defense to be able to withstand that. And so we could defeat it, but we weren't quite ready yet. Fafnir was also too strong for us with that triple attack at the moment. And there was also Ironclad, who was pretty much like a different tier to what we had at the moment. So those four enemies were undefeated. Three of them we can come back and defeat, but one of them, Jumbo Flan, will of course remain forever unbeaten. Now at this point, I will say to you, there is at least one more enemy that you guys should know is not one that I can defeat in the Monster Arena. Not counting Nemesis, because obviously I can't unlock Nemesis now, because I can't beat uh, Jumbo Flan. But there is one more enemy, so I will leave that to you guys. It's a very obvious answer for experienced players, but if you're a bit more of a newer player, maybe you've only done this once before, or you're not too familiar, try to have a think of the battles ahead, and uh, think to yourself which one could be categorically impossible. In any case, you'll be finding out relatively soon. And so with the Species Conquest first run completed, I was pretty happy with how far I got. And I wanted to quickly check back in on the Area Conquest and see if there was anything I could defeat that I couldn't get last time, because I did have much better stats than I did before. As you can see, getting status proofs is very difficult. So you need to kind of defeat stuff that's going to drop them for you already. 
That's one of the best ways to do it because you can't, of course, steal for things. You can't bribe enemies, you can't do any of that stuff in this challenge. So finding ways to customize um, multiple status resistances of a high level was definitely one of the, the struggles in this particular challenge. And so eventually I did spend a, quite a lot of time thinking about this and saying, well, what can I even do here? And then I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe it is time for the first ultimate armor of the run. Let's do it. So I decided Kimari is probably the one most likely to stick around because he does have alchemy and maybe that could make a difference. So I decided of the three guys here, maybe Kimari should be the one that gets the ultimate armor. I thought, you know what? I have 99 dark matters. I can make a ribbon. And even having one character with ribbon against something like Marlboro Menace, that could obviously make the difference between failure and success. So I decided Kimari was going to be the guy. And so Kimari fans, once again, you get to you get to enjoy a moment of Kimari being the biggest badass of the party. And so I decided to give him the break HP limit and the ribbon. I figured for this particular challenge, break HP limit, ribbon, auto regen, and auto phoenix was probably my best bet. Because finding and getting X potions is so unrealistic in this game, and they're only going to kick in when you go below half HP, I figured auto regen, especially if you decide to try and get your HP all the way up to, say, 99,999, then it might be the, the best way to heal automatically without doing anything. So this was a, a big moment here. And once again, of course, I saved before I did this in case I end up regretting this decision. But it was time to give Kimari the ultimate upgrades. Break HP limit and ribbon. Getting like a, a second ribbon was going to be so difficult <laughs> that I really had to make sure I used it on the right armor. Otherwise, it would have been horrible. So... I decided to go with this combination here. So Kimari ends up being a status tank here because he can survive all the statuses pretty much and he can revive anybody who has quad nine with maximum HP. And so I felt like this was gonna be the, the best chance I had to defeat some of these enemies that give you the nasty status effects. So I was getting ready to try and defeat some enemies that had stumped me in my previous sesh. Now, unfortunately at this stage, I barely had over quad nine. So I had the break HP limit. But I really couldn't put it to use yet. Um, I, I had kind of hoped at this stage maybe I'd gone a bit further beyond it. But um, it's early days yet. We still have a long way to go in terms of our stats. We're still nowhere near max stats. And we've already cleared like a significant portion of the monster arena. So we will get there. But there's still a lot of work to be done. So that's what Kimari's stats look like right now. He's looking very formidable. And I think with this, hopefully, it should be enough to take on at least Marlboro Menace and defeat it. So let's see what's going to happen after I make these final little tweaks and get back into it. And yeah, continuing to work on that magic defense because we do have enemies that are wiping us out with powerful magic attacks that hit everybody. So that's going to be a must if you want to survive and complete this particular challenge. Oh well, at least defeat as many bosses as we can in this challenge. So Tynus was now up to 76 magic defense. Let's take it on once again and see how far we go. So Kimari is key here. He's going to be the difference maker, hopefully. I decided to forego the alchemy first and see if that would be enough um, because he can do a lot more damage that way. So I want to see what we could do. So Malbro Menace rematch. Ambushed, of course. Putrid Breath. Let's see what Kimari does here. Look at that ribbon goodness. Just a reminder that Ribbon did not exist in the US release of the game on PS2. It's kind of crazy, like imagining life before Ribbon. Obviously those guys didn't have the Dark Aeons and stuff either, so there was kind of even less reason to have it, but obviously Ribbon is so strong and so useful that it's going to be amazing against many high-level endgame enemies. But you can see all the way down to 16,000 damage, but the auto region is helping him climb back up. So you can see the damage coming back up there. So that's really satisfying as well, I have to say. Look at that, back up to 25,000. But I was unlucky here, I think. I think that was just unfortunate. He didn't really get a chance to revive anybody either. Like no one who was confused hit themselves or revived anyone. So this was a bit of a messy attempt, but I think it was proof that Ribbon could definitely make a big difference here. So yeah, Marlboro Menace got the win here, but I was pretty convinced that I could do it and that was just a little bit unlucky 
with Kimari being taken out so quickly. So it's time for another attempt. With these, I like to get a few attempts in to really see if it was just unlucky RNG or if fundamentally I'm not strong enough. That one felt to me like it, it's still within the realms of RNG. So let's take a look again. I think if Kimari can land plenty of hits and keep his HP high, there you go. He's already done like 250,000 HP damage. And Malboro Menace has like 640 or 630 or something along those lines. So I think we should have this battle in the bag. So this was a much, much better outcome. Look at this. Everybody's back and we're doing massive damage. So it was, I think, bad RNG the first attempt. This is much more like how it can go down. And there it is. Okay, so Malboro May is defeated, and Ribbon was a pretty big difference maker there. So there we go. I felt like at this stage, I surely got to be able to complete the area conquest at least, with no exceptions. So the next one on the hit list was Abaddon. Abaddon, Abaddon has such low HP that I felt like I, should, I could just take it out before it even used its big move. So let's see the damage here. Still quad nine damage. My magic defense is, of course, still bad. Pharaoh's Curse on the perfect person here. That worked out brilliantly. I feel like there's a chance I could take it out before ever seeing the big move. But I couldn't. And so now it's time to see if my magic defense held up or if it could break the damage limit. It can, but Tylus's higher magic defense than the other two helped him stay alive. And so did Kimari just about. So I felt like, okay. If I survive that, then this battle is a formality. And so it was only a matter of time before we put in the final few hits here and did what we needed to do to grab the win. But then he decided to mana focus again, and I was like, wait a minute, if he uses another one, then I'm going to die at this stage. So suddenly I was, I was starting to panic, thinking, oh shit, I'm going to fail now. But then finally Tidus put in the killing blow, and just in the nick of time I managed to defeat Abaddon before he got me again. So that's another one done. And if I could just defeat Vorban as well, then that would mean that I've cleared out all of the area conquest. Let's go. Ambushed annoyingly, and it comes straight in with a body splash and basically KOs everybody. <laughs> Thankfully, Kimari with break HP limit survives. And that could be key. Let's see how this goes. We are doing terrible damage. This guy has the tough uh, armor status, of course. But that attack is also not good. Thankfully, we are just about kind of in a survival loop where we're managing to survive, but there's just too many big, strong attacks that hit everybody. There's magical attacks that hit everybody. There's physical attacks that hit everybody. And in relative terms, this agility is not too bad either. And so Vorban proved to be too strong for me still. I mean, seeing that body splash do quad nine across the board, that was pretty um, surprising, I would say. I was definitely not expecting that. I did want to give it another go. As usual, I don't want to just like lose once and then totally give up. This one felt like I kind of needed to see a bit more. I got a bit unlucky with the ambush and the immediate body splash and that kind of stuff. I felt like I got to have a better run than this. So like, Two mortars in a row is also bad RNG. It's definitely not even close to 100% counter rate here. So this one was going to be very RNG centric uh, if I was to win and probably a bit too RNG centric to make it worth it. So I died quickly a second time and I thought, you know what? It's got so many entire party attacks that it's just not worth it. And so I had to take a break and leave Warban alone uh, for this one as well. But at this stage, I'd actually gotten to a point on the sphere grid where I didn't actually have enough sphere levels to have like a proper chunk of leveling up. So I thought to myself, you know what? I got a little bit carried away here. I kind of forgot about Omega. And if I could make this much progress in the monster arena, maybe I've already gotten to a stage where I can defeat um, Omega. So yeah, I did turn random encounters off because I just wanted to quickly get down there. Uh, I've proven beyond reasonable doubt that I can take out everything here very easily. And so to save myself some time, I did turn uh, random encounters off and headed down towards it. To be fair, at this stage you could customize a no encounters weapon, but it's just redundant. You're just wasting time to customize it, to do it legitimately. It's like, who cares? They serve the same function. 
So you can either go out and try to, to farm for no encounters weapon, or you can just press F3 or F4, or whichever one it is, like a couple of times, and it's fine. So, yeah, I'm going to end this video with one more attempt against Omega Weapon to see if the change in my um, setup and my stats would be enough. So Kimari now has more than quad 9 HP, so that could be an important factor. He also has Ribbon, and so I thought maybe those two things, along with obviously like the greater stats, would be enough. Now, as you can see here, everything is kind of pre-programmed. So whenever you come here, until you defeat Omega Weapon, you will have to fight these guys every time, even if you have the booster, like the No Encounters cheat, basically, unlocked. So it's that's how hard-coded into the game it is. It just will not let you get away with that. So, yeah, I'm going to skip these encounters. You've seen it already. Uh, with Ribbon as well, even, um, even Great Malbro is irrelevant. So we're going to keep moving here and go straight to Omega to wrap things up. And so before long, after defeating this Master Tomberry in literally 0.2 seconds, I was ready to take on Omega once again. So I had a quick look at my Sphere Grid and my equipment to see if there were any further little tweaks I could make. Uh, at this stage, again, I knew that the enemy had like a million HP, and I had taken out things with HP of that level. So I thought, if I can really get a foothold in this battle, and I can survive its biggest and its worst attacks, then I should be able to get the job done. So made some final preparations here and I had some extra purple spheres lying around I figured why not just use them every little helps basically if I could hit 99,999 then the battle wasn't going to last very long anyway and that's one of the main things it doesn't have the tough armor on it and so if you do have good strength and you have the, and you have the celestial weapons then it's a really nice combination and you can really like eat away Omega's HP very quickly and so after I cashed in the final scraps of sphere levels that I had, we were looking pretty good, I'd say. I, I mean, looking at these stats here, this should be, I would say, more than enough to take on Omega Weapon and defeat it, other than the Nova attack. If we can't survive Nova, then we will die, but there's a pretty good chance we'll be able to defeat it before Nova ever gets used anyway. Once again, before the battle, I thought, you know what, this setup took me a little bit of time, and so I wanted to get my auto save in. Even if it meant fighting these guys again, I didn't want to go through the sphere grid and make those preparations one more time if I lost. And so I quickly did that, and then it was time to take on Omega. Though, to be honest, you are going to gain a few more sphere levels before that, so you could do this little auto-save trick, and then gain maybe another four or five sphere levels, and then kind of do that again. But <laughs> let's see what I chose to do in the end here, once I got through once more. Yeah, so I literally ended up with six more sphere levels by the time I came down here. But then you kind of get yourself into an infinite loop of, hey, let me just cash these in as well and then auto save. So I thought, I'm not going to save again. I'm not going to cash in any more sphere levels. And so with that, it was time to take on Omega Weapon one more time. Let's see if we can end the session with a win against a pretty significant boss. Omega Weapon definitely sits somewhere in the monster arena in terms of its difficulty, like area conquest level, I would say. The upper area conquest level. So we should be strong enough to take this guy down. Let's see how it goes. 95,000, 89,000. So even at around 150 kind of strength, you're basically doing almost absolutely max damage. But, of course, our HP is going to come down and we don't have a way to heal back up to maximum except for Kimari. So we're going to get a very quick, very strong start here. But depending on how quickly our HP comes down collectively, we might slow down a lot nearer the end. But really nice critical there. And you can see how slow Omega Weapon is. And this is one of the things that still makes it a relatively easy super boss. It is so slow that even once you get to these like mid-tier stats, like your, your agility can be under 100, your strength can be like a 130, 140 kind of range already. You're in a position where you can wipe the floor with Omega. Not even close. So you can see, I mean, I would have cashed in a total of maybe 99 sphere levels or something. And that is the difference. I mean, I'm still nowhere near 255 for anything. And still got absolutely destroyed. So Omega not having that sort of um, protection, the, the tough armor status does count against it here, unfortunately. But there is also another important factor here. Omega weapon drops break HP limit armor. Let's see what we end up getting as a result of our success here. Genji Bracer. This means we have a break HP limit 
for Auron, which is huge. Now, the frustrating thing here is that it only drops a maximum of three slots. So let's have a look at this armor here. I only got two slots. So I think this is some bullshit. 100% Omega weapon should only drop four slot equipment, which is, I mean, basically everything you fight, almost everything you fight in the run-up to Omega himself gives you four slots, potentially. So Omega only giving you two slots or three slots, I think is just horrible. Um, but because of that, basically you can't really make any ultimate armors usually because there's just not enough slots. But for this particular challenge, break HP limit is not easy to get. And so getting any kind of break HP limit is a good idea. Now, can you go back and sort of reload that auto save or reload another save and try to farm until you get at least three slots? I think it's probably a good idea. But at this stage, it felt like reloading the save, um, trying to use the auto save, it doesn't seem possible because after the win, like by the time you find out uh, what you got, it might be a bit of a problem. And so doing all of this kind of save file shenanigans to try and get the drop I wanted felt like it was a bit unnecessary. So I think I decided to just leave it at that. I did have my break HP limit for Kimari, and I did have one now for Auron in case I needed it for a specific situation. So. I think I'm going to wrap up this session here. It was, a, it was a really productive one. We beat a lot of the Monster Arena. We beat almost every single area conquest, except for Vorban. And we took out the vast majority of the Species Conquest too. And we kicked Omega's ass second time round as well. So good progress was made. And as you can see, we're really starting to get towards the business end and coming up against like the hardest enemies that demand big stats. And we'll see how we do against those guys. You've seen break HP limit and ribbon come into effect in this video. And so we are really starting to push towards like our limits. And so we'll see what happens in the battles to come. So thank you all so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video as well. As always, early access available for this series on Patreon. It supports the channel massively. And you guys get to be the cool kids who enjoy these videos before the public does while supporting the channel in a major way. So I will see you guys for the next session. As always, a lot of cool battles and big battles still to come. Thank you for watching. Take care.